um, as I always tell people, we used to have people always come to our house and want to show us vacation pictures, you know, but we pulled the curtains and locked the doors and acted like we were at home because we don't want to see it. <laughs> we don't want to see it. So why are you feeling so compelled to post them on Facebook? Hey, look at me. I'm on the beat. And I had tacos for dinner. And I'm drinking a big old margarita. Shut up. I don't care. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Okay, we have, first of all, I'm going to do a dramatic sunglass reveal. If you're watching it, if you're listening, you didn't see that. Awesome. Okay, that was my, let me try it again. CSI Miami, right? And then you say something cool. Looks like he's not going to be changing the pipes around here or something like that you know they say at a pool right they're standing by a pool or something like looks like he got his pool cleaned okay let's looks like he got his that's it needs to be more like that let's try it again here we go looks like he got his pool cleaned i'm batman okay let's move on all right um hmm my guest today Welcome to the podcast, y'all. Lone Star Plate. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Did I even start there? I didn't. Anyway, uh, we have a special, this is a special week, okay? We're doing a two-parter with Dale Hansen. That's right, Dale Hansen, the legend, okay? The legend. Uh, this was such an honor. This is our second time to have him on. And the reason we're, we're having him on, you might have heard, you might not have, he is retiring in September. So, uh, we had such a long conversation. It was so good, epic, I would say. Uh, we're doing a two-parter. So this is the Dale Hansen week. Okay, so both episodes are going to be for Dale. This is the first part of our interview. Um, again, this is epic. It really just ended because his iPad died. That's honestly, it would have gone longer. Okay, we'd be doing a whole month of Dale Hansen. That was true. And I just asked him one question. Okay, no, I'm kidding. Um but um, it, it was awesome. He's awesome. I, I, I respect the man so much. I, I you know, grew up watching him. Um, it's fascinating, like, to talk to him. Um, and, I, you know, everyone I grew up with knows him. He, you know, some people hate him. Most people love him. Uh, but, you know, he, he's that type of person. He's, um, you know, he says what's on his mind. I appreciate him for that. Um, he speaks his mind. Um, he's not afraid to step on some toes, say some things. And, you know, I get wanting to retire probably a bit, you know, big part of it too. is just like, man, you know, you gotta be real careful nowadays. What you say, people are just ready to, you know, cancel you if you will. Um, so not saying that that's what's happening. I'm just saying, um, you know, cause he did have a joke that he, he said about, um, you know, women and not working and it, it was all ironic. I mean, that was the joke. That's the fun, you know, that's the irony of it. Um, anyway, you know, only Texans got it anyway. Um, I, I, I totally wanted to ask him about that and he would have, you know, been honest about it, but, um, we just didn't have the time, uh, funny enough. <laughs> In fact, I had a whole bunch of notes that I didn't get to. Um, that I wanted to ask him about because that's Dale Hansen. We just started talking and where it goes, that's more interesting to be honest with you. Um, so, you know, he gives his reasons for retiring, why, what he may be up to next, what he thinks of certain things. We look back on his career on certain things, um, just a phenomenal conversation. So this is the first half of it um, on this episode. Okay. So, um, and you know, one thing I wanted to talk about right here, look, you, you can't see it. Well, if you can't see it, okay, look, I've got this uh, keychain here. Okay. And it's got this little bullet. Okay. On it. It's got my name, but you know, when you see this, you think, oh, he's got a bullet. He's into guns. The truth is I don't have any guns. I don't like guns. Not really. I don't really like guns. Um, I have no problem with you having guns, you know, I'm not one of those. I, I'm, I'm that type of liberal. Okay. Where I, I really don't care about guns, but you know, can't judge a book by its cover. Because you would think 
that that's where I stand or that's where I'm at or when people see it. And I don't really think about it, but the truth is it just comes in handy too. This little point right here, I can use it to open things for real. Um, so that's kind of Dale. Can't judge a book by its cover. He's basically this keychain, this bullet right here. You know, Dale is not who you think he's going to be. And that's what makes him so fascinating. You know, that's what got him his appearance on Ellen, right? It's Michael Sam commentary, give him national exposure, uh, which he already had in some instances. Uh, I wonder how much he regrets that Ellen appearance now. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, that's funny. Couldn't have been on another talk show. Uh, anyway, no, of course, it's fascinating, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's what I love about Dale. Um, you know, you just, you don't know what you're going to get and you know what you're going to get all at the same time, you know, it's kind of awesome. It's like, it's like a buffet, all right? You don't know what you're going to get, but you know what you're going to get, okay? That's what it is. Right. When you get invited to some party and you're like, what are they going to have? What's it going to be? You know, it's going to be good, but you don't know what they're going to have. OK, that's still that's still he's that party. He's the party you got invited to. Um, anyway, yeah. So this is the first half. Let's get to it before we do. So quick word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food, and then we'll be right back. Hi, I wanted to talk to you about other things that are on the Texas Real Food site that are just as amazing as putting in your zip code, finding the best place around you that's serving, you know, all natural, fresh, organic ingredients, all right? There's resources on there. Reviews, blogs, articles, and most importantly, Texas Real Food recipes. So you can find things on there that really aren't on any other site. I promise you that and stuff that's pretty standard, but we give it a twist, right? That's the chef way. Something familiar with a twist. So we've got, for instance, cinnamon spiced hot cross buns. You can also find a great Texas strawberry cheesecake recipe. Just amazing stuff. So please check it out at texasrealfood.com. All right, back to the show. All right. As always, please check out the Texas Real Food website. Okay. Uh, and of course, please follow us on social media, Lone Star Plate TX. And uh, if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and the notification bell. Okay. Because uh, we release new content every week. Oh, and we're also switching our Lone Star Plate wrap up show from Thursdays to Mondays. Okay. At noon. Okay. So eat lunch with us on Mondays. Uh, we're going live on YouTube to wrap up. That way, give people a chance to listen to the episodes. I was doing them Thursday night. We released the last one on Thursday morning. It's like not enough time to wrap up, you know. So anyway, give give people the whole week to listen to the episodes, and then we'll go over the uh, week's episode. So again, the Lone Star Plate wrap-up show, Mondays at noon, Texas time, Central, all right, uh, 12 p.m. Uh, on YouTube live, okay? So comment, talk to me, or just review it after it's gone live. Anyway. All right, let's get to it, guys. Uh, Dale Hansen retiring after 38 years at WFAA Channel 8 Sports Broadcasting. The legend, Dale Hansen. Again, this is part one of our Dale Hansen epic podcast interview. Again, this is the second time we've had him on the podcast. So if you want, check out the first interview we did with him last year. Also an amazing epic podcast as well. And uh, yeah, it was great catching up with Dale and uh, super excited for you to listen to this. So again, Dale Hansen, part one. Enjoy. Hello, how are we doing? I'm doing. I'm doing. Just barely surviving. <laughs> I remember this just like from last time. I remember. Uh, you yeah. set this up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dale, for, for coming on. I, re I really appreciate um, the opportunity. They're cleaning the house here, so let me get her to stop here. There we go. All right. Oh, no worries. Is that the Roomba? Because I have one of those that goes off constantly. No, no. We got the young, uh, got the, the, the maid, the weekly maid here, you know. So. <laughs> nice. That's the life right there. That's what I need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a while, anyway. Yeah, right on. 
Well, again, uh, Dale, thank you again so much. Uh, we really um, appreciated the last time you came on. It was such a great episode. We had such great feedback. Um, it was awesome. So, you know, when we heard uh, what was happening in September, I said, we got to reach out and get Dale on again because first yeah, it was just an think, amazing conversation. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. We we didn't uh, we didn't talk about September I guess the last time around. No right? no uh uh-uh. uh you hadn't that that hadn't even wasn't even a thought I don't think I mean maybe it was yeah. I don't know. When did we, long, when, when did we do that last conversation? We did it um, last year like around September I believe. Oh was it that long ago? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah no mm-hmm. I wasn't a thought at all. I went, I mean it's it's been a thought for about five years quite honestly. Sure but, uh, sure. It, it didn't yeah. start coming fruition until december you know january somewhere in that time frame so yeah right on i read um uh, yeah i read that that the um that the pandemic was a part of that reason is that true yeah yeah it, uh, i actually i think a pretty big part of it i i, I kind of like staying at home instead of driving up down 35 you know? <laughs> boy I do that- i understand that I, I hated the concept of wearing pants again, you know, uh, <laughs> all, all of that. And uh, uh, I still haven't worn, I still haven't worn a pair of shoes in 15 months. I mean, wow. I mean, dress shoes. I, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm still doing, um, even going into the studio, um, uh, I'm, I'm wearing tennis shoes and, and, uh, and a lot of days I'm just wearing my warm up suit pants or, uh, uh, what do you call them, dockers or something? Yeah, I haven't put on a pair of dress slacks and done the whole bit uh, in 15 months. And, wow! Uh, so they've got me kind of off to a side, and I told them, "Well, just tighten up the shop. I don't have to dress." <laughs> That's right. Keep it right here, right? Just keep it right here. I love it. That's great. That's great. Yeah, maybe for the last show, you'll dress up. Maybe a tuxedo. Yeah, I might have to put on a pair of shoes or uh, yeah. put on a different pair of pants for that one. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Maybe. I mean, whatever. Yeah. You feel. Or, you, or, you, or the birthday suit for the last one. Right, right, right. Let's go out in, the, in a blaze of glory. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've, got, I've got, I probably won't, in all seriousness, uh, uh, I mean, it depends. I, I, I've got, a, I don't even know what they call them. They're like dockers or something. Yeah. But I mean, they're solid blue and they're, they're not the big old baggy ones although i probably should but they're they're, they're a nice looking pair of dark slacks and and i've got a pair of uh, uh which i happen to like but you know the dark tennis shoes and uh, uh you know so I, I probably won't wear that I, i've been pretty casual for the last couple of years anyway and uh, uh you deserve yeah, it that pandemic, that, that pandemic kind of it just kind of changed a lot of things and uh uh you know just just the bottom line is I've always wanted to be that guy. Um, we're not recording, are we? Yeah. Yeah, we are. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, did, I thought we were just chatting. No, uh, I, you know, we, we edited and stuff and I do a separate oh, intro. Yeah. I do a separate oh, intro, you know, way here. No, but, but, but no, I, I've always wanted to be that guy um, uh, that, that left a year early in, instead of leaving a year late. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, it's an old branch Ricky theory, an old baseball general manager for the Dodgers, you know, back in the forties and fifties, uh, and, and I just think there's a great deal to be said for that. You know, it, it's like any any good show, any good comedian. You know, you yeah. want to get off the stage when people still want you to keep going. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a singer. You know, nothing I hate worse. Um, yeah, I, I love Willie Nelson, for example. And I, every time I've seen Willie Nelson, by the end of his concerts, I'm like, God, you can't possibly know any more songs, right? <laughs> he goes forever. He yeah. goes forever. And first yeah. time I saw Bruce Springsteen, I actually laughed. I mean, he had horrible seats at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. And I actually laughed because he played for like two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, no. Whereas my, my, my favorite uh, uh, guy is, is Rod Stewart still. Oh, and, wow. And yeah. Every time Rod Stewart, every time I've gone to a Rod Stewart concert, he quits. And I'm like, no, oh, man, I know you got five. <laughs> Which is the best way to do it. Um, I see. Go out on top, yeah. right? I mean, essentially. Well, I, I hope so. I think so. Yeah. And, oh, uh, for sure, uh, Dale. That's what, what I, that's what I wanted to accomplish anyway. And uh, yeah, I, I think I've done that because again, 
I, I, I've just always been afraid of, of being that guy. And I've seen some of them in my business in particular that I just wish they would have stopped earlier uh, because unfortunately it's, you know, it's like they always say about, you know, well, that first impression is a lasting impression. Yeah. Well, the last one, the last one is more so. Uh, that's true. The last, the last thing you see or hear from someone, that's really the lasting impression. And, um, uh, you know, a friend of mine was kind enough to say, he said, well, you know, you, you still got your fastball. You know, your fastball still humming in there at 95. Uh, <laughs> and I like to think it is. Um, um, but at the same time, I knew the end was, was close. I knew, you know, I, I knew it wasn't like I'm going to do this for five or six more years. What is it, it that you think is, is you're not able to provide or something? What, what is it that you think like, oh, um, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Well, to me, to me, it was just that I really just don't care as much anymore. I mean, uh, oh, uh, I get it. I, get I, it. I just, I, I really don't care if the Rangers, uh, you know, losing streak keeps going. I, I don't care. Uh, the Mavericks, uh, the Dallas Mavericks are in a big turmoil about a new coach and a general manager. And, and the reality is I don't care. Uh, <laughs> Cowboys, Cowboys may or may not, you know, be a contender this year, which would be 25 years in a row. They said they would be, but they haven't. Um, but, but I don't care. You know, the, the only thing that I really enjoy and have really enjoyed the last couple of years is, is writing my commentaries. And, and I don't think that's fair. To, to be the to be the main sportscaster at the station, it, it's not fair to the audience uh, that I don't have that same passion for sports that I used to have. It, it, it's not fair to the station, and at the end of the day, it's not fair to me. Um, so I, yeah. I think I got to put that all together, and I thought, nah, the, the WFAA needs a sportscaster that has the passion that I used to have. I mean, I used to live it and breathe it, and I'm, I'm up first thing in the morning and I'm heading out to Valley Ranch for the Cowboys interviews at 10 o'clock in the morning so that I could be there. Now I'm like, nah, I'm not going. Hey, I went to every <laughs> Rangers game, every Mavericks game, and I'm like, nah, I'll check it out on TV, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and again, I really do. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not kidding anybody when I say that I think, I think the station deserves better. Um, I think I'm good at faking it sometimes, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, I've never, you know, for the most part, what people get from me is, is exactly what I feel. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always kind of proud of the fact that I, I do wear my emotions on my sleeve and, and if I'm not happy, it's pretty evident by watching oh. it. You know, I, I'm not saying I fake it to that extent. Sure. I understand what you mean. Question. I've had to sit there at times and kind of gear myself up a little more to like, hey, let's act like this is really important. Sure. When in fact, I just don't think it is. Yeah. Now, the commentaries, for example, you know, I'm on fire. Sure. Uh, with, with, with the anticipation, looking forward to the response, the good and the bad, but, but getting all fired up, trying to figure out who the Mavericks new coach is, uh, I couldn't possibly care less um and and that's that's a ridiculously poor attitude to have if, if you're going to be the main sports guy <laughs> <laughs> i think you're right Dale. i mean I, yeah that totally makes sense that's what makes you so great right that you can recognize even that about yourself and 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 make that for the fans right like that's amazing yeah. do you think you would have done these commentary do you wish you to have been doing these commentaries like your whole career well it, it, partly but at, at, at the same time i don't think i could have um I'm talking to some of my younger guys right now who, who will be following me at, at, at the station. Uh, and, and one of the guys is, you know, he's in his early thirties and he's a great writer, uh, Jonah Javad, just, just an absolutely uh, tremendous writer. And, and he made the comment that, well, I, I can't say some of the things you say, I can't do some of the things you do. And, and I think that's true. It's like, I've always told people about the Michael Sam commentary, that, that I, which is basically still the one that I think, put me on the map. I've been sure. doing commentaries in some fashion for about 20 of the 38 years, maybe even a little bit more than that, actually. Um, but they were, they were absolutely traditional sports commentaries. Yeah. I uh, see what you mean. You know, 25 I see what you mean. Five years ago, whatever. Um, but it, the Michael Sam commentary put me on the map, put, certainly absolutely. Put me on the national map. 
Yeah. And, and at the same time, I, I couldn't have done that if I was if I was 31 years old. I mean, if I was 31 years old, you know, look like you with a flat belly and a full head of hair, uh, I don't think people would have looked at that the same way. It, it would have been, oh, yeah, of course, you know, young guy, of course you think that way. Sure. I think one of the things that separated my commentaries um, was the fact that it, it was shocking to a lot of people that an old, fat, bald, white guy in Texas <laughs> would would say the things that I say. Yeah, uh, I guess for a little bit of shock value to some people, sure. not to me, but to some people. Um, and yeah, they so thought you were very conservative, right? As well, that that's just an assumption by people. Oh, everybody assumes that you know that I vote the straight Republican ticket, or you know, sure. yeah, you know, I, I make a few dollars, and so I must be on that on that side of the issue. And, and I, and I just haven't been since I was, well, since I was 17 anyway. And you know, I think that of it by itself shocked a lot of people. So it, had I, had I even tried to write the Michael Sam commentary when I was 30, 32 years old, I don't think it would have worked. And I think it, it, it it's a little bit frustrating to me that the, Although at the same time, I find a great deal of satisfaction in this. I mean, you want to talk about the oxymoron that I deal with. It, it's a little bit frustrating. The, 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 the best, the absolute best moments of my professional career uh, started when I was like 64. Wow. And, and yet at the wow. same time, it's a little bit frustrating that the best moments of my professional career started when I was 64. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wish it somehow could have started, say, at 44. But then I did have, um, it, it was different then. I mean, when I was 44, um, I, I, that's when I kind of first started making the bigger money at Channel 8. I was doing the Cowboys games on the radio. They were going to Super Bowls. Uh, the Mavericks were winning NBA championships. And I enjoyed all of that. I mean, I loved all of that. So I think my life has just kind of played out the right way. That, that, that when I was younger and I had this ridiculous passion for the games themselves, I was going to Super Bowls, the Stanley Cup Finals, a, a couple of World Series appearances wow. by the Rangers, um, mm -hmm. the NBA Finals, you know, a couple of times with the Mavericks. I had all of that. I wasn't writing or saying anything that amounted to much, but I was covering the games. And I thought, well, that's really a big deal. Um, only to realize later in life, well, I, yeah, no, that was nice, but this is really good. When sure. I have an opportunity to have an impact on, on a person's life, where I, where the emails that I've gotten over the years are just staggering from, from people who were, who, who were impacted by whether it be the Michael Sam commentary, uh, the domestic violence commentaries, the, the racism commentaries, the the sexual assault commentaries. Um, every one of those, when I read about how this helped somebody or uh, shined a light into a darker corner that somebody was dealing with, um, that that touches me and affects me more than than any time I'm sitting there partying with Troy Aikman because they won another Super Bowl. <laughs> Although those would be incredibly fun days, I might add. But, uh, uh, yeah, so I, so I think when it's all said and done, um, uh, I, I think it played out the way it probably should have. I, I was yeah. at I was at my fifty fifth high school reunion recently. Wow, fifth. They I didn't even know they do those that far. Well, I didn't know I was going to be around to even think about it. <laughs> uh, well, and what's funny? They, I'm from a little small town in Iowa, and and I've been to every five year reunion since I graduated in 1966. That's amazing. And, that used to be a very big event. I mean, with the dinner, the whole school, and they, they would honor the five-year classes, right? But then every class was was coming, whatever. Yeah. Several years ago, they stopped having the, the traditional reunion. So my class in particular, which always was kind of a special group, it, we, we just seemed to have a bond. And uh, I've always called it the spirit of 66. And, and I think there's something to be said for that. We continued the tradition and we would like uh, rent out the country club for the night, um, you know, get a restaurant and bar and, and it'd be just our class and a few special friends from the surrounding classes because they no longer have the, the traditional uh, uh, gathering for the reunion. So we've always continued it. So a couple of months back, a buddy of mine said, well, you want to do it again? 
And I thought, well, you know, if, if, <laughs> if anybody else wants to show up, I will. We had people fly into Iowa from California, Michigan, Arizona, and Texas, among other states. Wow. And we had, uh, you know, I think there were 18 of us um, out of a class of 63. 15 have died. Oh. And 18 showed up. And um, we had a heck of a fun night. And um, uh, it, 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 you know, I'm kind of hoping we do it again for 60. You know, uh, my, Absolutely. My, old, my old football coach was there. He's 90 years old. He looks wow. better. Yeah, he looks better than anybody in our class. He looks, <laughs> he looks fantastic. Got I mean, if you get to 90, you know what you're doing, right? I mean, pretty much. And I'm telling you that if you didn't know, I promise you this is true. If you didn't know, you would walk into that class and say, oh, so you graduated in the class of 66. He, he's 90 years old. And I promise you, he looks better. And he's in better shape than, than many of us wow. who actually graduated in 66. So when he was leaving at the end of the night, I said, hey, I'll see you at the 60th. And, and Coach Brewer turns around, he looks at me, he says, you really think I'm going to make it for 60? And I said, there's a better chance you will than I will. <laughs> I, I there's a better chance you will than I will. And um, <laughs> I would not be surprised that if I make it to 60, and we do have another reunion, uh, I would not be surprised to see him there. And, uh, yeah, what do they it, say it, when you go to the reunions? Like uh, they know they must know, you know, obviously who you are and what you've done. Like, you know, they're all very supportive, I'm assuming. No, well, they're supportive in, in, in this context that, you know, hey, we're, we've been buddies for, for 70 plus years or thereabouts. Uh, most of them are hardcore conservatives. Uh, uh, they're, they're there were a couple of liberals there, but we, we, I had some great conversations with a friend of mine and, uh, you know, one guy in particular, and he said, explain this to me. We grew up together. We've been friends for over 60 years. We played ball together. We had the same environment, the same basic teachings, et cetera. And he said, what, what, what made it possible for you to go one way? And he went completely the other in terms of politics. Yeah. And, uh, and we had a great discussion about it. And we had a great discussion about it. And it, it, it was a little frustrating to, to realize that so many of my friends are, are, are basically, in many cases, some cases, I should say, hardcore uh, right-leaning conservatives. But the one thing that I've always argued, and I said this to, to, to these guys in particular, we're still friends. We, we, yeah. we had conversations. We, we debated the issues, some a little more heated than others, but sure. any good it gets a little heated, you know, right? of course, but nothing of course. Gang, no name calling, no, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm Absolutely. like, and I said to him, I said, this is what frustrates me more than anything. That so many people just literally choose up sides. And if you're on the other team, you're the enemy. And that's just not right. It didn't used to be right. And we were talking about this. We, we came out of a, a, out of the 60s, which was an incredibly uh, hard time in America into the early 70s when we actually impeached the president, actually followed through and, and <laughs> would, have, would have removed him from office had he not taken the easy way out by resigning. Yeah. And the country was split and the country argued about it, but, but not to this level. At least I don't remember it that way. You know, there were the people holding up their signs, love it or leave it, you know, the hard hat guys, you know, the nonsense. But, but, it wasn't anything close, I don't think, to what it has become over the last, you know, 10, 11 years. Sure. Um, and that's incredibly fresh. I still got a lot of conservative friends who, who do go through life like I try to. Like, it, it's not my fault that you're wrong. You know, I, I, <laughs> I accept the fact. I, mean, right? I, I love I that. I accept the fact that you're incredibly stupid. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it's not my problem, you know. <laughs> But, oh, and man. I'm fine. I am oh. totally fine with them looking at me like, like you're, you're a liberal moron. Yeah, that's okay. Now you want to have another beer? Exactly. You want to play exactly. cards? Yeah. You want to go play golf? <laughs> and that's what I've done in, in great part uh, most of my life. But I've lost friends the last few years and I've lost family members. Uh, oh, literally. Wow. 
uh, I have cut off relationships with some of my family members, not because of their politics, but because they take that to that next level and, and the vitriol and the sure. hatred and the obscenities that they put on Facebook and Twitter. And I think that's the defining difference. I was going to ask you we if you think social media is oh, the, you know, catalyst for that, right? I, you, you, I, I've been saying it forever that social yeah. media is going to destroy our civilization as we know it. I, I really do believe that. I used to start, I started saying it years ago, just kind of as a joke. But now I really believe it to be true. Yeah. I think there might have been a lot of people that felt the same way in 67 during the civil rights era, in 72, 73 during the Nixon era. But they didn't have a platform to put their stupidity on display. Yeah. So they just kind of grumbled to their wife or their husband and they went about their lives. And, or at oh, the bar, okay. right, with their friends. Yeah, exactly. Let's go have dinner with Dale and his wife, you know, whatever. And life went on. Now, and I've got a very good friend who continues to do it, and he pushes the envelope on me, in my opinion, and he gets real close to the edge of, of, of just, he feels compelled to post something on a Facebook or a Twitter or whatever. And I'm like, why do you do that? What, wh wh why? Did, he said, well, you do it all the time. I said, well, I'm, I'm paid to do it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. Big difference. Big difference. It, it's a little bit different, but I said, even then, I don't say the things you do. I, I, I'm yeah. not. Yeah, people don't like a lot of the things I say, but I, I don't go anywhere close to some of the, the vitriol and the hatred that, that, that my own sister has done and, and, and my brother-in-laws and my other family members that I've, that I've just severed ties with. And, and I look at him and I think the Facebook, there is this compulsion that everybody wants to be on display. And as a lot of my friends do say, well, you don't understand the, the, the desire or the need because you've been a public figure for, you know, 50 years. Yeah. And I, there might be something true to that. But I mean, I don't do Twitter. I don't do Facebook. Well, I, I don't feel I need to. But, but when I retire, I promise you, I won't. I just won't. Um, as I always tell people, we used to have people always come to our house and want to show us vacation pictures, you know. But we pulled the curtains and locked the doors and acted like we were at home because we don't want to see it. <laughs> we don't want to see it. So why are you feeling so compelled to post them on Facebook? Hey, look at me. I'm on the beach and I had tacos for dinner and I'm drinking a big old margarita. Shut up. I don't care. I don't care. Right. I didn't care in 66 and I don't oh, care man. now. And yeah. every time Ed Leonard would walk down the hill to show us his stupid vacation pictures, my dad would jump up, pull the curtains close, lock the door, and don't say anything when he rings the doorbell. <laughs> That's when they would get you stuck on the clicker, right? And there would be yeah. one picture. Here's me at the beach in oh, front of it, and then click it again. Yeah. <laughs> my, my wife does it all the time. My wife does it all the time. And I'm like, you stop it. Would you? Well, no, it's good for my friends. I said, Leave me out of it. Well, then they're just going to think that I'm vacationing all by myself all the time. <laughs> you keep this up, you might be like, <laughs> leave me out. You know, I just, I just hate that. And then, you know, when I tell my friends that, they go, well, yeah, but, you know, you're on the air talking about your vacation. I said, well, it, it's in the crosstalk and people want to know where I've been and, yeah, I mean, and again, it is a little bit of a contradiction, you know, but, but, but again, I'm, I'm paid to do it. Absolutely. You know? Yes. And, and People want to see you, right? Like <laughs> that's part, the truth. Part, of, part of being successful on television is being a part of their family. They, they have to feel that they know me and I, and I'm completely okay with that. I mean, I think as you probably noticed in our two conversations, I'm, I'm a bit of an open book. Um, I don't keep a whole lot hidden, um, but I do that in part because I think the audience is entitled to that. But my point is they have the option to, to turn on the TV and, and watch whatever it is I do or not. Um, I guess you could hit delete on Facebook or whatever they call it, unfriend somebody or whatever. Yeah. But and again, I really don't mind if you want to send me a picture of your vacation. I, I won't bother to look at it, but but still. <laughs> but when you then cross that next line and say Barack Obama is is the N-word, or uh, which I've had people 
do, obviously, or that's uh, crazy. Or, or flip it around, you know, that you know that the man who would be king, you know, should be tarred, feathered, shot, you know. Don't don't say that kind of stuff. I mean, that, we I don't need to know that. I don't need to hear it from you. Yeah. Just let's let's just go through life as best we can. Then we die, and somebody else picks up the baton and they go forward. Uh, but I, I I just think we're in such an incredibly dark place. And I do blame social media uh, for part of it. I mean, you know, you have to choose to participate in it. But um, I've said it. I'm serious. Social media is going to destroy our civilization as we know it. And um, um, I I just I think, unfortunately, I'm right about that. I mean, I you make a lot of great points for sure. How do you think social media plays into sports? How do you think it's affecting sports? Do you think it's affecting sports negatively too? Oh, I think it is very much so. And you're starting to see it now where where you know, like golfers are being enticed, professional golfers are being enticed to be active on social media and they sure. get a bonus if people care. Uh, you're looking at the name image likeness thing that we're starting now in um, in college football or soon will be. Some states have already started it, but it's only a matter of time. And, and now we're going to, and like there was a great story I'm reading this morning about uh, coaches and, and, and administrators being concerned that the so-called concept of a team will be lost because it will all, be all about the individual, uh, you know, making sure that his likeness is being out there and, and his image is being promoted and compensated. And, and again, I, I realize I'm probably a bit of a Pollyanna here, but uh, you know, th- th- this whole concept of, hey, look at me, uh, it, that's been an issue for quite a while. But it used to be a case of uh, when, when the individuals would do that, they, they were somewhat ostracized. I mean, not by everybody, of course, but, but there, to me, there was always this attitude of, oh, th- this is such a, a selfish pig, you know, that, that OK, you want to make it all about you. Fine. But you're not on our team anymore. You're not you're not my favorite player. Um, and now I think the whole concept is being developed. It's all about me. And I just don't think that's going to work. As I've been saying lately on, on a couple of recent commentaries about the NCAA and the Supreme Court decision, it is, it, it, it's horrific for me to try to defend the NCAA, and I'm not, because you can't and you shouldn't. Uh, the NCAA is a corrupt organization. But I do not go to bed crying at night because some quarterback for for, uh, uh, Alabama didn't make as much money as he thinks he should have playing college sports. Uh, um, I just think there are bigger issues at play here. Um, And and, and as I said last night, as a matter of fact, on on my show, well, if we're going to pay the college athletes, because everybody seems to be so convinced that we have to pay the college athletes and allow them to make all the money they can from their image on social media and commercials. Well, then I think we have to pay the high school kids. I mean, they're charging to go to a high school game. They're broadcasting the games. The coaches are paid a lot of money. Uh, School districts are are building fancy stadiums. And then I think those, those little 12 year old kids that play in the little (laughs) world series at Williamport, where's their cut, right? (laughs) Jim Where does Porter, it stop? You know, well, at least whoever is doing the games now. But, sure. you know, the, the broadcasters get paid. ESPN sells the broadcast rights and they sell commercials and they make money. The city of Williamsport makes a lot of money by hosting it. Well, I think those 12-year-old kids from Tokyo deserve a check. <laughs> Cut them a check. And, and I'm like, where does it stop? Where yeah. does it stop? I mean, the, the club leagues, et cetera. I realize it's an old fashioned concept, but had I had the ability to play college sports and I I had offers to play small college sports, um, but, but I wasn't interested in the education anymore. I knew I couldn't, I couldn't handle the classroom another day, (laughs) but had I been, had I been that star player, even at the age of 17 and as stupid as I was, I don't think I would have ever stood back and go, you know, I'm going to need $100,000 to play basketball for Iowa. I just, wow. I refuse to play basketball for Iowa unless somebody pays me $100,000. I would have crawled on broken glass to play basketball for the University <laughs> of Iowa. I, 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 would have, I would have done anything I could 
to play baseball for Texas or Wichita State or whoever the, you know, Southern Cal, you know, whatever. It, it never occurred to me, nor would it have. Uh, and I don't think it would have if, if the situation was, was flipped around today. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, just, I, I just think there's such a level of greed in all of this, and certainly led by the NCAA, for starters. Sure, but, sure. But I, I kind of look at it, instead of compensating players with, with money, which I think is a never-ending uh, money pit, it's going to be like that Tom Hanks movie, you know, about the house. With, oh, money. With Shelley Long. Give, Great movie. Yeah. No matter how much money you give a player, they're going to want more. There's there no such thing as, oh, well, that's fair now. That, that's yeah. fair. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever that's does a, that. That's no, interesting. That. Yeah, you're right. So I'm saying instead of attacking it by throwing more money at players, why don't we attack it by taking money away from the, the schools and the universities and the ticket prices and the, the administrators and the NCAA officials, you know, since, since the NCAA officials are demanding that the players play for free, well then why don't, why don't we take some of the money away from them and reduce their financial status a little bit? And then those ticket prices, which are just out of control. Absolutely. Have to buy seat licenses to the, to the football games nowadays. You know, I, I can no longer even go to a Nebraska game by buying a ticket. I have to buy a seat license for the right to buy the ticket. And, and most That's people crazy. can't either one. Yeah. And then, oh, by the way, once I get there, the hamburger's $9. You know, the nachos <laughs> are eleven fifty. you know? I mean, it's just, it's just obscene. So let's, yeah. let's start from that side. Let's bring it all back down so that John Q. Public can actually take his kids to a game. So that the family can enjoy the outing. I mean, nobody thinks in those terms, obviously. I'm the old, I'm the idiot. Great points. Yeah, I mean. Great, great points. I sit there and they go, well, you know, we, we can't just keep paying uh, the Dirk, Dirk Nowitzki's or, the, you know, Dak Prescott for the Cowboys gets $40 million contract. How about this? Dirk plays or Dak plays for $30 million and the ticket prices come down. Jerry Jones makes billions of dollars. How about this? Jerry Jones makes hundreds of millions of dollars and the ticket prices come down. Nobody ever thinks about that. Nobody ever even wants to suggest such a thing because the American way is that Dak Prescott should get every dollar he can. Jerry Jones should make every dollar he can. And as long as we can keep pulling those dollars out of the pockets of average Americans, nobody cares. I do, but nobody else cares i mean i went to a, i think the last Mavericks game i went to there was a couple of buddies of mine there i went over to buy uh three beers and it was like 19 dollars. and oh i said God. i don't want a case of beers yeah i don't want the case. <laughs> you know we're just drinking three but then i also went to a rod stewart concert at a place in dallas and and a margarita was 16 dollars oh my god 16 dollars that better be the best that, margarita I ever had, right? Oh, my gosh. They, they should just mainline it straight into <laughs> yeah. my blood. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just obscene. But, yeah. you know, they got to pay Rod Stewart. They got to make money. They got to, you know. Sure. And it just the, never stops. I mean, it yeah. just never stops. And um, but, but I think this is going to be that proverbial can of worms has been, has been opened. And I think it's going to be an ugly mess. Uh, there was a lawyer for the players the other day saying that, well, they're not going to go out and recruit kids by offering them cars and, and, and tons of cash. And I go, really? Oh, really? They've been doing yeah. it for 50 years when it was illegal. Absolutely. Now and legal, you know oh, about well, that, especially. Oh, oh, now it's legal. No, we're not going to do it anymore. Are you yeah. kidding me? They're going to do mean, it more, right? I mean. Of course they will. And why wouldn't they? Why so wouldn't now, they? Now, Oklahoma and Texas will be in a massive bidding war for the best players. Um, and again, that benefits the players individually. I, I, I get that. But then what about, and again, I'm just picking out there, but what about Baylor and Texas Tech and Houston and SMU? Um, although they could afford it as well with their boosters. But what about the school that just doesn't have that kind of access? And Iowa State, I mean, I, I get off the top of my head. Sure. What if Iowa State doesn't have a bunch of rich donors that are willing to just throw money at an 18-year-old kid? Like, I know Oklahoma will. 
I know Texas will. Uh, SMU used to, so they may well do it again. <laughs> I just think it's going to create a bidding war that, you know, and maybe, as some people say, well, that, that's been going on anyway, so nothing changes. But sure. I just think it's obscene. I, I, and, and, and that takes us right back to where we started. I'm just so tired uh, of looking at this nonsense. I'm just, I'm so disgusted by so much of it. Because w w when I started covering sports 50 years ago, I was so incredibly naive. I was so incredibly <laughs> innocent. And I really did think that players played for good old Nebraska U and yeah. Iowa. For the, for the heart, right? The pride. Yeah. For yeah. The, and for the betterment of the team. And, sure. And some sure. guys did. Some yeah. guys did. Absolutely. But as I've always told people, the more I know, the less I enjoy and like it. And, and I've just seen so much of it. I've just You're seen, seeing behind the curtain, right? I mean, essentially. I, I pulled the curtain back and yeah. that. that that is one ugly witch standing back. Yeah. There. <laughs> you know, speaking of the SMU, um, you know, thing that you broke, you know, that whole story. And yeah. I, I sort of rewatched re uh, some of the, you know, just new stuff on it and, and some of the stuff you have done on it as well. Um, you know, coincidentally, we had Reginald Ballard on the podcast um, who w used to play on SMU when that happened. Yeah. Um, and he went on to star in the show Martin, right? With Martin Lawrence, he became yeah, a man, yeah. and 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 you know, all these different things. And we talked about that a little bit. You know what he said? He said that that was actually, in retrospect, the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Really? Yeah. Well, they because, weren't saying that in '87. Absolutely. And he said that. You know, like I <laughs> back then, I didn't think that, but now looking back at my life and where it's gone and when the yeah. opportunities, it it you know the path it it, it led me down a different path. I'm forever grateful for that happening. Uh, you know, I thought that was interesting. Well, I hope so, so. I, I, I've got a lot of friends, believe it or not, from that team. At the same time, I've got a lot of people who still hate me from that. Uh, sure. Bob Costas, uh, Bob Costas was doing a deal. Um, uh, they have a thing called the SMU Athletic Forum, and they bring in some of the most high-profile sports figures in the country. Well, Bob couldn't do it in person because of the pandemic, so they agreed to do it like a similar, whatever you call it, Zoom or uh, yeah. hook. And, it, and as compared to doing a speech, which he was going to do in person, you, you can't do a speech on Zoom. I, I, I tried it one time and I'll never do it again. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's the most ridiculous thing ever. So anyway, he calls me and he goes, uh, I would like you to interview me. Um, you know, and obviously Bob's a little bit like me. You, you can't throw a question out there and then you just lay out. And he'll, yeah. he'll off me. But and I said, oh, fantastic. But I said to him, I said, Bob, here's, here's the problem. I, I don't think SMU is going to allow me to do it. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm talking about my SMU investigation. And Bob Costas goes, oh, my God, that was like 30 years ago. I said, oh, <laughs> trust me, they have not forgotten. <laughs> couple go by, oh, a couple of weeks go by, and he calls me, and he goes, oh, I, I'm so embarrassed. He said, I told them that you would be willing to do the interview, and they said, find somebody else. Now, I don't wow. know if it was the school president or something, but whatever. But no, it, it, it's, I, I, I'm at one of my little favorite cigar bars a, a couple of months ago, and, and uh, uh, an SMU player was being honored on the basketball team, uh, a former player. <laughs> and so he's holding a big party there, and he hollers at me to come over to his table. And, and, and again, all these SMU people, and they're all fine, and we're laughing and joking and talking about it. And all of a sudden, I turn to shake hands with this one guy, and he kind of slaps my hand. So I'd never shake hands with you, not after what you did to my university. Wow. And, and he was pretty, you know, pretty upset. Like a 40-something-year-old businessman carrying a grudge from that nonsense. And what was so funny about it, <laughs> he's, act, he's, you know, he's kind of bowing up like he's a big tough guy or some nonsense. I'm just fine. <laughs> And all of a sudden, the general manager sees it. There's a little conflict. He runs over and he grabs the guy. He said, hey, buddy, I need Hanson in here a great deal more than I need you. So he <laughs> just got up or you're out, you know. And That's I crazy. Him, hey, you might be an SMU guy, but I tip very well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Man, that's so crazy that it's still um, lingered oh, no. on. You know, I was thinking also, like, you think um, 
you would still do that story today? Oh, I, oh you mean individually? Oh, yeah. That yeah, would, um, absolutely. But here's the real caveat to that question. And I've had this argument in our newsroom many times. We did that story, and I, I don't remember the exact dates, but it was, it was somewhere around like April, uh, maybe early May, something like that. I get the first call. Um, th this uh, employee of the SMU Athletic Department just gives me the tip. I mean, no, no great work on my part. That, that's where almost every great story comes from. Oh, it, wow. It, it, you know, somebody okay. gets called up, they're unhappy about something. So anyway, I get this call. We start digging into it. A great producer named John Sparks did a, a, did a ton of legwork on it. Yeah. Mike, a lot of different people. We don't get that story on the air until November. And every time we would have something, the lawyers would be involved. And they said, well, we need to double check that. I said, we, we've already like triple checked it. They said, well, check it again. Check it again. <laughs> wow. And we did this time after time after time. They said, okay, well, we've got, we've got David Stanley, the player that was at the center of this story. Yeah. Uh, that John Sparks said, interviewed, right? I saw that interview. Yeah. yeah. I said, well, we've got him saying this. Uh, and we know that the, the, the coaches and the, 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 athletic officials are lying and he said well we need to double check it again so we had lie detector tests we had the fbi a handwriting analysis i mean the point being this investigation took three four five months i've argued in my newsroom with a lot of different people i think we'd have done that story in less than 48 hours oh wow i, I really do now they 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 deny it they all say that wouldn't happen but I think it was suggested, if you remember what you see, I get the call uh, a couple of days later, we go over to SMU to interview Henry Lee Parker. Uh, he was the, the athletic coordinator, Bob Hitch, the athletic director, and Bobby Collins, the head coach. And they're all sitting around this table. It was suggested in our newsroom back then, we've got to get this on tonight. Was that and the I one where you showed the letters to them? Is that the one where you're talking yeah, about? Okay, yeah. Have you ever sent David Stanley anything at all? And all they had to do was say, yeah, we sent him an insurance form. And we're back to square one. We knew that they sent David Stanley that letter. We had no idea what was in it. We couldn't ever prove what was in it. Now, David Stanley said it was money, which, again, I'm pretty sure it was. But, but all Henry Lee Parker had to say was, I'm glad you reminded me I sent him an insurance form. Yeah. But the point here is, we get back to the station. Now we've got David Stanley saying they paid me. We've got, as Bob Hitch, the athletic director pointed out, a disgruntled employee telling us that they're paying. And we've got three men in suits and ties saying that it's just not true. And yet the argument was, we got to put it on tonight. And yeah. I said, put what on? And they said, let the public decide. I said, let the public decide. You want me to front a story accusing Southern Methodist University of cheating based on a drug user and a dropout and a disgruntled employee. I said, no, I, I won't do it. I won't do it. They said, well, we have to. We got to get this on. And four months later, we eventually did. Wow. Because we did it right. We, yeah. we double checked, triple checked had lawyers vetting everything to make sure that we were being fair, whatever the argument was. I, I think today, oh yeah, we, we'd, we'd absolutely do the story. Would we take four months to do it the way we did? I don't think so. I, yeah. I, there, there's such a need to be first. There's such a need uh, to break. And, and at the same time- I Was think anyone else trying to break that story? Was anyone else trying to break the SMU story like next well, to you? Well, not for our knowledge, but we were concerned that somebody would. Sure. And, and I said, well, I mean, if that happens, that's, that's unfortunate. But, yeah. you know, I, so I think what happens now, though, is, and you see this at, 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 the, at the network level, at the highest levels of, of broadcast news, you'll see a network report. And the report will say, so-and-so accuses so-and-so, and they deny it. You know, the Matt Gates case is a classic yeah. example. Sure. Matt Gates is accused of having sex with a 17-year-old girl. 
And the only evidence that anybody presents is, well, this person says it happened. And then Matt Gates says it didn't. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I, I mean, are you kidding me? You're accusing a man, uh, a man I despise, by the way, but you're accusing a man of statutory rape and based on, yeah, this guy says it happened. No evidence to support it. And then you turn around and you say, hey, we didn't do anything. We gave them an opportunity to deny it. And then they just float the story out there and then the Twitter world picks it up and off we go. Well, since one station reported it, well, now every station reports it. It sure. then becomes the late night talk show jokes, yep. which are kind of funny, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yet, I sit there and I look at this and I'm like, what the hell are we doing? What the hell are we doing? We throw accusations against the wall as long as we give people the opportunity to deny it. And we do it with impunity saying, hey, we didn't do anything wrong here. I'm not saying that he did it. They're saying that he did it. I'm just reporting what they're saying. And I, I did my due diligence. I gave them the opportunity to deny it. And I, I just think that's wrong. I mean, I, we, we yeah. see that not every time, not sure. every time. But I think one time is too many. And, and, and I think we've gone... We've gone down that rabbit hole where we've got to get that information out there. We, there was a station in town that used to have a promotional campaign. Um, it, you know, first on our station, right? First, first on our station. And they made a few mistakes along the way. And then I, on the banquet circuit, I go, well, it's first on their station. <laughs> it's right on our station. <laughs> I and, like that. That's funny. No, I, I mean, I did. <laughs> first on... <laughs> 10 let's just say yeah first on 10 right on eight and uh <laughs> but then yeah they, they did that a lot they, they would they would put stories out i mean great titillating stories with no real evidence to back them up and then they would just simply fall back on hey we didn't say that yeah we said they said it that's and a dangerous game right deny it. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I do think that, that I think if the same, if I, I, I really do, I think if the same situation presented itself today, uh, that that story would air in, in, in 48 hours. And, and, and under no circumstances could you do the legwork that was required that John Sparks sure. and Mike Caps and George yeah. Reba and so many other people did to make that story have the weight that it did yep. when it really aired. And, um, I, I think that's I think that's a serious problem in journalism. I, I I think one of the biggest problems that we have faced, and it basically started when I started back in the seventies, that local news used to be a public service to the community. It was kind of like, ah, hell, we got to do local news to get our license, and oh, we're required to do some public good. All right. <laughs> and, you know, we put most of those shows on at four in the morning and three in the morning. You know, you'd have an interview with the doctors or whatever, and you'd <laughs> bury it on Saturday night at one o'clock or whatever. And then all of a sudden they realized, you know, we can make money doing this. I mean, people are willing to buy commercials on our newscast. Well, then the next obvious step is, well, if we're going to sell commercials for our newscast, we got to have the highest ratings. So that we can charge the highest price. Yeah. And once news officially became a money maker, because I don't think I don't think it was ever, it wasn't considered a money maker in the fifties and the early sixties. I mean, you know, the, the, the great Edward R. Murrow story is that he was doing some unbelievable news, but they they had to get him off because they could you know do I Love Lucy or something and, and make more money. So Edward R. Murrow, the greatness of Edward R. Murrow eventually gets pushed out the door at CBS because there's money to be made. Then wow. you fast forward a few years and, oh, hey, Walter Cronkite's bringing in dollars. And then it just seeps all the way through the system. And then by the 80s and 90s, it was just a rush to be first, a rush to be number one, a rush to make money. And if that meant that we had to cut some corners, to get some titillating information on the air, we do it. 
everybody does it. And, uh, sure. and I know that sounds like the rantings of the old man on his way out the door. And uh, <laughs> I hate it, but, but it's, it's the way I do feel many times. And, and then the bottom line is I am the old man on my way out. The door. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of how it is uh, right now with the news, too. I'm sorry. I said, I think that's how it is with the news today, too, right? I mean, it's get the story out. It's 24-hour news cycle. You got news coming at you from yeah. every which well, way. You don't you don't know what to, right? That's sort of the big thing amongst just whatever everyday people is just like, well, what, what do I believe, you know? What, what, what can I believe from the news, you know? What well, can I trust? I think like you see in cable, um, so-called cable news, I, I always said to people, well, well, you know, you're an idiot because you get all your news from CNN or MSNBC. I said, no, I don't. I get very little news uh, from them, very little news, nor do you get any news from Fox. The real problem is, is that we portray it as news and the average viewer doesn't understand the difference. I mean, I don't have a problem. I mean, I love uh, like Brian Williams on NBC uh, or MSNBC. I, I love his show. Um, I, I kind of like Rachel Maddow a lot, uh, um, you know, and I understand, I mean, I don't, but I understand why people watch Tucker Carlson and Rush Lim, listen to Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and, you know, all that. But there's, there's not really what I call news there. There's, there's infotainment. I mean, yeah. you could get some information. I mean, you, you know, you could get some information and I think it's fine if you have the ability to parse that information. And Oh, by the way, Here's a really crazy concept. How about checking the information that you hear? <laughs> going to another source. Now, I know this is outrageous, but I've had Brian Williams in particular say a lot of things. Now, I'll laugh. I think he's very snarky. He's very, he's very funny. He's very, I think he's in a perfect spot right now, quite honestly. I just, I just really like his show. But every so often he'll make a comment and I'll go, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that. Oh my gosh, I know what I'll do. I'll check it out. <laughs> I'll find other sources, right? Yeah, yeah. And who does that? You know, well, no, Rachel Maddow said it, end of conversation. Chris it's Cuomo true. said it. Yeah. Tucker yeah. Carlson said it. Uh, sure. And then Tucker Carlson's own lawyers go to court to defend him by saying, no sane person believes that to be true. Yeah, that's funny. I read I read that in an article about that. Yeah, yeah that was hilarious. <laughs> that I was hilarious. The, I told the people at WFAA, if anybody ever defends me against any kind of a lawsuit by saying, you can't believe him, <laughs> <laughs> we're done. You know, we're done. I mean, Absolutely. I would be, I would be so embarrassed sure. if I was portraying myself as an honest uh, informational outlet for the news, that I am the voice of reason that, that he and Hannity and, and people of their ilk tried to portray. And my own company said, you can't really believe that. I mean, come on. <laughs> but there's no shame. There's yeah. no shame in some of these people. And sure. you know, again, I'm not defending a, 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 you know, Don Lemon, I'm whoever it is. But I've never thought, I do think, I still argue this with my friends. I do think if you watch David Muir, uh, Nora O'Donnell, and Lester Holt, I, I do think you get a pretty good newscast. It's not Walter Cronkite and Tom Brokaw and, and uh, you know, John Chancellor and Huntley Brinkley, you know, whatever. It's not that uh, necessarily. But I don't, I don't detect the bias, uh, and maybe because, maybe because it is as liberal as my critics say it is. But, but you watch, you watch David Muir's newscast, Nora O'Donnell, Lester Holt. Those, those to me are still pretty solid newscasts. Yeah. Um, you know, every so, as I said to, as, as I said to a conservative friend of mine just this weekend, who was arguing that the network news is incredibly uh, liberal. I said yes. It is because most of those people are educated and educated people tend to be liberal. You know? And it really, you know, the more education you have, the more liberal you are. Funny how that works. Funny how that works. You know? oh, that, that's funny. That just, is funny. I, I thought maybe you went deaf on me there for a moment. Yeah. I thought that was a pretty good line. But, but no. it, it's true that, that yes, if, if you are of the position 
that anything you disagree with is somehow a liberal slant. Well, yeah, okay, okay. Now you can call it liberal, but I, I don't I don't perceive that as liberal. I mean, there's a lot of stories on the network news that, that I don't particularly agree with, or or I think the reporter took the wrong tack or you know didn't sure. ask the questions or you know, whatever that is. Yeah. But but I, I don't look and again, network news I'm talking about. I mean, the ABC, NBC, CBS, Evening News. Yeah. I, 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 I don't look at that the way I do. You know, the other shows, the CNNs, the MSNBCs, the Fox, uh, I, I look at those as infotainment and infotainment only. I mean, um, they can tell me all they want about what a great news authority they are. And some of them are better than others. I mean, I, sure. I think Jake Tapper is very good. But I mean, he's, you know, he, he, he jumps off the rails and which I happen to enjoy, um, but it's but like Jay commentary, Tapper, right? More than news. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, Jay, yeah. Jay Tapper says a lot of funny, great things. What? Yeah. But you can't say that if you're doing news. I mean, I'm sorry. Sure. You just can't. I mean, I happen to think he's right, but he's just saying it because he knows it's clever. He knows it's, he, he believes it. I, at least I hope he does. I think he does. Um, but, but you can't say some of the things that, that, that some of these people say, if you're going to portray yourself as an objective journalist, the real problem that, that creeps in is, is that, the, you know, the, the objectivity of a journalist is really still in the eye of the beholder. I mean, it's like my own commentaries. I mean, again, I, I think I've made it very clear where I come from politically. I, I sign it. it. It's an opinion. I mean, whatever. But even then, I've said things that I'll go to my grave arguing is just, just kind of a simple statement of fact. And oh my gosh, they just, they just go nuts on me. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're remotely upset about. <laughs> but they're upset because I said it. And sure. they know that I'm this crazy liberal guy that they don't respect and whatever. Yeah. Um, but that's, that just kind of makes the whole product hard to sell sometimes. It just, uh, uh, and again, we are in a society where, where people are in their bubbles. I happen to enjoy getting out of my bubble. You know, I, I don't need to watch some guy tell me all day long what I already believe. Uh, I, to I, me, I, that's boring in a lot in a lot yeah, of ways. I, to be I honest, do try to watch Fox and and because uh, I'm trying to figure out what's the argument. What, what exactly? That's my point. That's what I do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm not that's what that. I do. Yeah, you me know, neither. And, and the guy said, well, "So you watch you know, like you watch Hannity and and, and Carlson?" I said, "Yes." I have, I have a deal. I watch them until I know they lie. I watch them until I absolutely know they're, they're lying. Wow. And, you know, I, I, I usually make it a good 25, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. before I have to push. <laughs> you know. I've never made it to a full minute yet, but, but you know, <laughs> one of the days, you know. I watch like the YouTube clips. I can't watch like a whole show or go through any of the no, intro I, or any of that. Not, but I'll, I'll watch a clip here and there on something. Cause yeah, I want to know what, what they're thinking. Why are they thinking that, yeah. you know, wh where's it coming yeah. from? What, what's the seed, right? Yeah. Wh wh why are they yeah. getting this information? I, I want to know because I don't care what they're saying at all. I mean, I really don't. What I am trying to figure out is, is the information that I know they're pumping into my friends. Exactly. And so you can very, ha have that as ammunition when yeah. you talk, not ammunition, but you know what I mean? I no, in exactly. your tool belt. Yeah, totally. Some of my very best friends are absolutely convinced they get nothing but the straight truth from, from uh, Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, you know, whatever. Sure. And, and, and then I will show them, and this is, this is, this is my always favorite thing. I will take the time and I will show them why this is a lie. Now, then the argument, okay, well, now was he lying or did, or did he really just that stupid or, you know, pick, I mean, that, that's usually what it comes down to. Well, it, he's either incredibly stupid or he's lying. I don't care. Pick one. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> well, the lawyer would say you can't yeah. believe him anyway. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, anyway. And then they always fall back on, oh, well, they all do it. I said, no, that's not what we're talking about here. You're telling me that you get all your information from Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity. And I am pointing out to you the lies. And every time I do that, the, the simple response is, if they know I've got them, you know, debate-wise, they know, they know I've got them, they then just immediately fall back on, 
Well, well, they all do. And I said, okay, name one. Well, they can't because they've never seen any of these other shows. Yeah. They, they live in that bubble. They live That's a good in point. But it, it, it's a it, it, it's a scary thing that we're in now. I mean, it's, it, it really frustrates me that, that I think, and I think I go back to this argument we were talking about with the 60s and the early 70s. You know, we at least, as far as I know, people believed Cronkite. They, they believed in John Chancellor. Uh, they, they believed in, in, in these reporters, in Tom Brokaw even, I think, in the early 70s, whatever. Uh, they, they believed in those people. And as, as Lyndon Johnson said, when, when uh, well, and then they said, well, then this came up just this weekend. And a buddy of mine says, well, yeah, but Walter Cronkite never did opinion. I said, he most certainly did. He went to Vietnam, wrote an incredible opinion piece that we should never have been there. We need to get out. And Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson said, well, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost America. Wow. Uh, and, and people tend to forget that. But wow. in part because you, you just believe that if Cronkite said it, 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 it must be true. And if sure. John Chancellor said it, it, and I think it was, I mean, I, I really do. Now, I still think when David Muir or Lester Holt or Nora O'Donnell say it, I, I still think it's true. Uh, or at the very least, it's as true as they can possibly bet it to be. I don't think for a moment when when Brian Williams, even on MSNBC, or or, or Rachel Maddow, or uh, certainly Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, any of them, you know, Anderson Cooper, uh, Chris Cuomo, I don't think for a moment that whatever they say is absolutely true. And if I have any doubts about it, I'm not afraid to vet it. I'm not afraid to check it out. Um, I, I just don't understand people who take anything as gospel. And I would say sure. the same thing applies to the network news. If you've really got questions about it, vet it. Check it. I, I'll give you one great story. This is what this is what happens when you get into that, well, what aboutism aspect. Yeah, sure. I listen to a, um, and I've never understood this. There, there's really just no good liberal radio. I don't, I, I don't know why that is. I mean, all the great radio shows are always conservative. I mean, Limbaugh, you're right. Yeah, Limbaugh had you're a right. great radio show, right? I mean, we had Mark uh, Davis the, on on the podcast too. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mark Davis. Yeah, Mark Davis, exactly. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know of any great liberal radio shows. They they tried, but they for whatever reason they just don't seem to work. So I found this. Uh, I think it's called Progress uh, Radio, and and I tried. Some of it's not bad. Some of it's some of it's. Uh, but I swear to you, this is true. I, I'm driving into work one day, listening to Progress Radio, and they run this clip. And, it's, and it was Kellyanne Conway. And she says, here's the quote. Uh, the, the, the clip they ran on the air was, we are sick and tired of America. And I thought, gee whiz. <laughs> she finally just blurted out something. <laughs> and I almost swerved into a ditch. <laughs> and, and the announcer or the, the host of the show comes on and he goes, can you believe that? Can you believe that? And he just starts rich. If, if, if a liberal had said that, if a Democrat, can you imagine what the conservatives would do if Barack Obama had said that? And I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be the biggest story of all time. And, and said, let's listen to it again. And he plays it again and then says, Kellyanne Conway, we are sick and tired of America. And I'm thinking, well, Kellyanne, it's been nice knowing you. you know, <laughs> get off the stage, right? I get to the station, and I thought, well, I got to check this out. Yeah. Do you know where I'm going with this? The actual quote, the entire quote was, we are sick and tired of America being treated like a second-class citizen in the world. That's a little bit different. Oh my goodness. That's a little yeah. bit different. Yeah. So I sent a nice email to uh, uh, the guys and the people at Progress Radio complaining that that kind of a stunt sets back the cause. Absolutely. It, it gives Absolutely. all the conservatives that thread to pull on. Yep. Let me show you what this lousy radio station did. And they didn't even bother to respond. They, uh, it's horrible. I all my emails, but they didn't even respond. That this station would feel compelled to do something, and again, it's so easily checked. Sure, and I think in part 
they probably knew that most of their audience wouldn't buy wouldn't check yeah wouldn't check it but the problem with that is the people that do right you're like man they they bamboozled me right like you're, you're not going to trust them it's gonna it's gonna really affect your trust with that radio station I haven't yeah. listened to it since. I absolutely haven't listened. exactly yeah oh, man, that's horrible yeah it, 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 if you're that if you're that shallow you're you're, you're that fraudulent I'm you're, you're looking for a story right you're just you're trying to make a story out of nothing essentially I mean, it just I, again I, I i was hoping to get some kind of an explanation you know yeah that why we did this Maybe the producer was at fault. Maybe he misled. But see, here's the same thing. You bring that to me, and and I, I know this sounds like, hey, look at me, but you bring that to me. I was, I got to see that. I, I got, I got to hear that. You know, I, I don't know how it works at at, at that particular station, um, but I've had I've had reporters over the years bring stuff to me, and I'm like, no, I got to see more than that. And they said, well, I, well, no, I promise you. I said, well, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm not saying you're lying about it. But I've got to have more than that. You need Before context, I, right? You need yeah. context. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I need to see the interview in its entirety. I need to see more. Um, because, you know, again, I make mistakes. I've made mistakes. I, uh, you know, and, and sometimes these things fall through the cracks because you do find yourself uh, it, 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 at many times at the mercy of a producer. The producer's running around like crazy, trying to get things done at the last minute, whatever. I mean, so there's a lot of reasons for what really is nothing more than an honest mistake. Sure. But I, I, that one in particular has driven me nuts for a couple of years now. That um, I, I, that kind of, but that kind of thing happens on Fox all the time. Uh, oh, stuff gets taken out of context yeah. all the time. I, I don't, Absolutely. I don't, I, I don't defend. I don't, and I would, my point is, I would never defend Progress Radio by saying, hey, Fox does that all the time. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Answer. But, but for some reason, at least all the Fox viewers I know, that's their, that's their go to position. Sure. When you, when you prove to them your guy said something incredibly stupid, well, everybody their does. Their go to it. position is, well, it happens everywhere. It happens. Yeah. Everybody and does. And it. I, yeah. I, I, I hear that too. That just don't believe in anything. I mean, that's um, sure. It, it must be hard to go through life not believing in anything like that. You know? That's a good point. You know, another thing is like, um, there, there's really no need to take things out of context, take things out of context or invent things or create things. The truth is there. Like there's truthful things we could know about that would equally blow your mind, you know? So you don't need to find things and make things up, uh, which you is know, what, because, right? I mean, I mean, especially with Kelly and Conway. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. With Kelly and Kyle, exactly. Like, say something incredibly stupid. You know? Yeah, I mean, 100%. It, just, it, just 100%. Becomes, it, it, it becomes easy pickings, you know? And, yes. Uh, but again, all it takes is that one little threat. And I've had so many. I, I've told that story, uh, maybe unfortunately so, but I've told that story and my conservative friends just go nuts. See, you're making your own case, you're proving our case. You're killing your argument. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm telling you how bad some people are. But I'm also telling you that I made the extra effort to check it out. That's right. You need to do the same thing. I, I'm getting yeah. my hair cut after the election. And uh, all six of them. <laughs> <getting tripped off here. laughs> and the guy who cuts my hair said, very conservative guy, hardcore Republican, uh, big Trump supporter, all that good stuff. And there was a story, if you remember, after the election circulating that more people voted in Michigan than were on the uh, were registered to vote. Right. Yeah, and I, I heard thought, that. Ah. He said, yeah, I, I heard it this morning. And, and he said, uh, this is why I think there's fraud. I mean, because uh, I, I saw the story. And so I immediately came home and started doing my research. And uh, the story was true. More people voted in Michigan in 2020, then were registered to vote in 2012. Exactly. But they left that part off. Of course. So the voter registration rolls increased dramatically as they have in almost every state in the union. And yet somebody writes the story because this is the other thing about social media. You know, people, you wanna be a journalist? Hey, 
you're one now. You know, just call yourself one and off you go. You know, <laughs> I've got a blog. I've got a blog. I'm Larry the Blogger. I make a lot of money. You know, and I just write what I want. I'm like some fat kid, you know, whatever. But I'm sitting there, it drives me nuts. And they write, some guy wrote, actually wrote it on a website that my barber happens to read that more people voted in November of 2020 than were registered to vote in the entire state, which I thought, man, if that's true, we've got issues. Absolutely. And it took about five seconds and I get it from 18 different sources. Other people that beat me to it in terms of debunking the, the deal. And I call him now, to his credit, he goes, oh, goodness, thank you. I, I hope he's sincere about that, but I doubt it. You know, yeah. I, he probably said, yeah, okay, fine, boom, and hangs up the phone. And- I, I mean, if you want to believe something really bad, right, you're going to mentally do some gymna- gymnastics up here to make it work. It, 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 it's, amazing. Um, uh, it, it's amazing some of the, uh, uh, of the, 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 the gymnastics, as you say, the, the, the jumps you have to make. Exactly. To support some of the things that have been said in the last three to four years in, in, in our highest offices. Uh, because, again, to me, the what about is, I mean, I always kind of do like the argument. And that's really kind of been my standard. If, what would I do if Barack Obama said that? Yeah. What would I do if John Kennedy had said that or, you know, whatever? Um, and, and I, 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 I tend to run rather consistent. You know, I am one of the few people that thought Bill Clinton should have been impeached, not because of his affair with Monica Lewinsky, because he, di- he lied about it under oath. You uh, can't yeah. be, in my world, you can't be the president of the United States if you're willing to lie under oath. I, sure. I would have impeached him in a heartbeat for that. Now, I think in many, many ways, he was a great president. The economy was great. Is that... Uh, and I don't really care that he had an affair with Monica Lewinsky. That's that's his that's his own deal. That's that doesn't affect me at all. Yeah. Um, but once he lied under oath, there, there, there was a like the president of the National Organization for Women came out in support of Bill Clinton. Wow. And, and I said on the air one time, "Hey, I'm just glad to know that 50 year old white guys could hit on 20 year old interns with impunity." I I thought that was against the rules. You know, gee. Gee, that changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> I got in a little trouble for that one. Oh, but man. Was, I love your was, humor. It was a shot about that transactional, uh, what was that term? Um, uh, transactional, situational trends, uh, whatever that phrase is. Situational ethics is the word I'm okay. looking for. Okay. And, and I, 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 I don't have that gene. Um, um, a lot of my ethics are, you know, what, what they should be. Um, but I, I don't ever bend my ethics to fit the situation. I mean, I just, sure. I just don't. If, sure. if, if my favorite president does that, okay, boom. You know, if my favorite ball player does that, that, that this, back into my world of sports, I mean, it drives me nuts how so many fans can have situational ethics when it comes to their favorite players. Oh, hundred like, yeah, percent. The, the the men who beat up women, the drugs. Sure. Uh, you know, I said, sure. explain this to me. How do you go to a game and cheer for that person, and then explain that to your twelve year old daughter? Explain that one to me, Daddy. Why are you cheering so loud for that person? Well, he's back from his drug suspension and uh, and beating up his wife. <laughs> He's back now, and, and it, it, it makes our football team better. And, yeah. uh, and his wife his wife is okay. She survived the beatdown. Uh, and, you know, he's going to drug rehab, and he's our guy. What the hell is that all about? How, yeah. how do you explain that to your daughter? How do you explain it to your son, for that matter? And, and it just it, it happens all the time, which was a, another reason. Yeah, they need somebody else. I get it. I mean, it's like connecting the art, you know, how far do you connect the art to the artist, right? Or the person to the art, I guess I should say, like, let's say, for instance, Bill Cosby, let's just throw that out there, right? Yeah. He he, Obviously, can you watch the Cosby show now? I can't. I'm I'm one of those people that I have a hard time disconnecting that for myself. 
right? If I know that about you, now I'm watching this or listening to this music, I can't forget about, you know, what happened or you did or whatever. I guess it's different for everybody, but I'm with you. Like, that's, well, that's, that's I, too I much. I what I do, but a lot of my liberal friends, I think, go, go too far. Yeah, like the Cosby show. No, Bill Cosby, I, I used to think he was hilarious. Bill Cosby. Me too. I'm not, I'm not watching any Bill Cosby shows. Me anymore. neither. Me and, neither. But, but Kid Rock, uh, who, who big Trump supporter, big, you know, I like some of his songs, you know, sure. but anyway, it, as long as it's in the legal sphere, you know, uh, you beat up. It's a more woman. as opinions. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, yeah. I see what you're saying. So yeah. You, you yeah. beat up a woman. You beat up a woman. I'm not buying a ticket to your concert. I, I, yeah. I'm just now you vote for Trump. Eh, that disappoints me. But yeah, if I like your music, I'm coming. Uh, yeah, hey, I you, see. If you do if you do illegal drugs, because I, I think the day's coming when, you know, I mean, marijuana in particular, probably even cocaine. Um, we're going to look back on this war on drugs as, as much as we look back at prohibition, you know, that we a hundred percent. We, yeah, we, we locked up people and ruined their lives because they yep. were doing what again? They were drinking beer. Yeah. They were drinking beer. Now, I don't do the marijuana. I don't do the cocaine. <laughs> mainly, mainly because I can tell I can tell just by the way you said it, just FYI. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't do the marijuana. <laughs> there, I, I already the, know the, that that's true. Not exactly the lingo. Yeah, not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 1982, 1982, I've been to Milwaukee with a good uh, buddy of mine, baseball player. And, and we're driving down the street after the game, going out to have a beer, or whatever. And he looks at me and he said, um, uh, "Do you do you party?" I said, "Oh, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll party all night long." He said, "I mean, no. Do you really party?" Yeah. And I looked at him and said, uh, "You mean like uh, marijuana, which is a big deal back then, right?" And he goes, uh, "Yeah." I said, "No, no." I said, "I don't do that." Uh, S H, you know, I don't do yeah. that. Yeah. And I said, why do you? And he goes, not after you called it that, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I'll drink beer with you all night long. Sure. I'll do shooters. I'll, I'll fry my brain. Oh, we've decided that's legal. But I can't sit in my room and smoke a joint. I mean, really? Are you serious? You know, yeah. I don't know about the cocaine thing. I've seen, you know, I've, but. Well, I, what I do find funny is that so many of the people who are opposed to the legalization of marijuana and, and, and drugs are the same people that say the government needs to get out of my personal life. Uh, yeah, I, I, exactly. It's my business. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm with you. Okay, but I can't, I can't smoke a joint. Well, you're at the country club, you know, doing six Manhattans or whatever, you know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I just alcohol's a drug. I mean, in my, I'm a, I'm a believer of, I'm very open on the podcast. I, you know, I've talked about my history and my life, you know, what I've gone yep. through. I, I definitely will partake in some uh, marijuana if it's around. I mean, that's, uh, I actually don't drink very much at all, to be honest with you. I, I don't like drinking. I don't like the way it makes me feel, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I'm actually a proponent of legalizing all drugs, uh, to be frank with you. I used to live in oh, Spain I and, I, and I and I live next to Portugal. They were the first country to legalize all drugs. And I got to fit with my own eyes, see, you know, how that change came about and yep. see the, the good of it, you know, what it can be to, to go that I, route. I, it's not a popular position, but not at all. I, I think number one, I'm a big believer in personal liberty and personal choice for starters. Sure. Number two, how's that war on drugs working out for us? Exactly. Look, I was part of the 80s, uh, yeah. say no to drugs. I grew up, yeah. you know, I was born in 79. I got fed all that, say no to drugs. You, you know what, really what the problem is and, and people my age, what they eventually learned when they got to like middle school, high school is they were lying to us because what yeah. happened is you smoked weed for the first time and you were like, wait a second, I'm not jumping out of windows and killing people. So you say they lied to me about this. What other drug did they lie to me yeah, about? And I, it makes you did, try other drugs. I did eat five bratwurst that first night, though. I yeah. <laughs> I tell you, they didn't lie about the munchies. That's true. The that uh, is a true point. Yeah. 1972, I smoked marijuana for five days straight. And, uh, and I mean, literally, five days straight. <laughs> I, was, I was going to school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I had never, I went all the way through the Navy. I never even saw marijuana, right? And everybody goes, well, they're, no, that's not true. I said, I promise you, I did. So I'm going to this school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was about 23, 24 years old. Everybody else was like 18. 
And, and of course, they thought I was a narc. They thought I was a <laughs> And then after I started smoking it, they realized, no, he's not a narc. He'd be better trained than this, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and all the black lights and all the, the, the posters, you know, spray paint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so the first night, I'll never forget, the first night was nothing. I mean, I thought, this is it. This oh, is really? I, oh, wow. They said, no, you got to kind of build up to it. I said, well, okay. So I came back the next night and I went, man, I'm starving. They said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I ate like five bratwurst. <laughs> and I was so bloated the next morning I got up. I did the only thing I could. I lit a joint because I got to get rid of that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did it for five days straight. They threw a pop quiz in the school. And luckily for me, the, the, the uh, so-called professor was like a 28-year-old disc jockey. And I was the best student they had because I knew this was my last chance to get any kind of a job in, in, in this country anyway. And so I, I'm, I'm studying like crazy. And they throw this pop quiz, but I'm, I'm basically stoned. And, and it really was like the commercial. I mean, well, how often do you give a station ID? Oh, whenever you can remember what the station <laughs> letters are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it 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 really was. They could have they could have filmed me taking that test and said, "This is your brain on drugs." Right? <laughs> so the, the the teacher he said, "Hanson, uh, wait after class." And he calls me up. He said, "What happened?" He oh oh I never mind. You're, you're I said, "Hey, I'm just telling you, you can't do it." He said, "I think you're going to be really good in this business. I mean, I really think you've got a chance." to be very successful in this business, but not if you smoke marijuana, not if you, you know, do, do that. And I thought, well, I think you're right because I, I'm so compulsive and I'm so obsessive compulsive about most things I do that it's either or for me. Sure. So I stopped and, and I've never done it since. Now I've seen it since I've been around situations, you know, but I honestly, I haven't done any of it since 1972. And, uh, wow. uh, you know, once I retire, maybe I'll just move to Colorado and open up my own dope shop or something. You know Are you kidding? Dale, I will be the first customer in yeah. line. I mean, you have no idea. Look, look I got it. Dale's nugs. Dale's nugs. No, no, you know, so, but no, I get, I just find it funny that, they said, well, you know, people, I said, no, they don't. And I think you're exactly right. It's kind of like the same thing. Like when, you know, my parents used to teach me about the alcohol and everything. And then you find out, well, it's, you know, they went so far. Exactly. Like, oh, if I sneak a beer out of the refrigerator, I, I grow horns and I, you know, I <laughs> oh, I didn't, you know, I yeah. didn't. I think I'll have another one. Well, I'm not Exactly. Ready. But and we have laws against driving drunk and stoned sure. and bear. We have yeah. those laws. people still people still ignore them too many times i grant you but but i mean there's just no logical reason it, it, in my opinion there's just no logical reason why an adult can't smoke a joint if they want to I agree. and we tried prohibition in the 20s it failed miserably we've tried prohibition against these drugs and most studies although again the critics don't believe it but most studies tend to indicate that the drug usage actually goes down. You take all that money you spent on enforcement and put it into treatment and education exactly. and, and taking care. Because again, we have alcoholics. I mean, we have alcoholics everywhere. And yet, I mean, people are dying by massive numbers, uh, in drunken driving accidents. And, and the families that are torn apart by alcoholism is devastating. Absolutely. And yet nobody calls for the banning of alcohol. I mean, they don't. I mean, they're doing all they can to control drunk driving, and I'm all in favor of that. And heck, I think everybody ought to have to blow into a, a, a deal to start your car. I, don't, I wouldn't even have a problem with that. That's a great but idea, actually. We try, we try as best we can to control it, but we can't stop it. So let's control it. Let's, Absolutely. let's legalize it. Let's make money off it. And then let's take all that money we've wasted trying to stop the drug cartels. And again, here we are blaming the drug cartels for all the problems in America. And you know this, I realize I'm preaching to the choir. You know why they bring those drugs to America? 
Because we want them. Exactly. They bring it because you know, we buy it. It's like they it's a, go where the market is. Exactly. You know? And oh, it's the drug cartels are out of control. No, it's the America. And if we took that away, I think I, I don't know the number, but I, I think there's a great number of people, a great number of people that smoke marijuana because they know they're not supposed to. You know, sure. I mean, I've, I've smoked wasn't, with people like that before. It wasn't Absolutely. nearly as exciting to drink a beer when I was 21 as it was when I was 18. I totally understand what you're saying. You understand? Absolutely. I mean, you know, yeah. When we're, in, when we're in the basement of my buddy's house and we're sneaking a beer. Yeah. Oh, my guys, we were yeah. we were rebels. We were just absolute rebels. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah it's exciting. Yeah. Now I can walk into a bar and have a beer. Nah, nobody that. cares right <laughs> everyone's looking at you like yeah well, what's the big deal you're having a beer you're yeah. supposed to it, it, yeah, you're right. but but i always find it funny and so like playing poker texas holdems illegal in texas because the people who say the government should stay out of our lives and allow us to make our own decisions and be responsible for our own decisions tell me that i can't spend my money playing poker Where's the logic in that argument? It's called Texas Hold'em, for Christ's sakes, right? right. Like Texas Hold'em. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just, you know, I, I don't want to see a casino on every street corner and big neon lights. I mean, you know, Vegas is nice for the weekend and Atlantic City. But, but that's kind of how Vegas becomes Vegas because yeah. all the states ban it, right? So a place has to make it happen. It, again, if you're going to ban things, people that want it, they're going to get it. You cannot stop people, right? Well, like, so, kind of crazy. It, it, it's, like, it, it's like the poker rooms. I mean, there's thousands of poker rooms in North Texas sure. playing illegal poker. Yeah. Thousands of them. And, and I used to play in them years ago. I, really I, play, I play an illegal poker game. I won't say where or with who, but it is, uh, I do. I don't care. No, I don't care either, but my station did, so I stopped playing in them years yeah. ago. Yeah. Oh, I uh, hope my podcast I, team doesn't mind. Yeah, oh no, and I, I, I don't do it, but I love it. It's my, my fault. If I lose, it's my fault. Absolutely. My fault, right? And yet the government officials, the ones who are most adamant about keep government out of our, out of our lives are in my life. I, I just, I, I just laugh at that. I mean, I find it incredibly funny. And what, what it also does for me is it kind of drives me down the road. Oh, you want the government to control that? No, no, no. I, I know how you operate. You know, you're such a <laughs> that can't be good. That can't be good. I mean, yeah. And it doesn't matter. Pick an issue. I mean, pick any of them. And sure. And now it's time for my favorite part of the show, the end credits. This is everyone responsible for making the show happen. Executive producer, Sebastian Sauerborn. Podcast manager, Nevena Ponovich. Marketing manager, Caroline Grape. Video and audio editors, Danilo Vojnov and Pavel Sebastianovich. Thumbnail designer, Marco Vukovic. Social media manager, Ursa Rusman. Guest outreach, Corey Menciez. Designing image quotes, Jay Apuya. Social media videos, Labri Fernandez. Outreach support, Yonet Del Mundo. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time.